the first chief scientific officer of the Metropolitan Police, Professor Lawrence Sherman, Wolfson Professor of Criminology Emeritus at the University of Cambridge, founder of evidence-based policing, and a man who's got a lot of experience in this field. He's in the studio with me. Good to have you, Professor. Thank you very much for coming in. Thanks. You're obviously a very learned man and a very wise man. What interests you in policing? What took you into policing? When I was a conscientious objector to the Vietnam War, I had the opportunity to work in the New York City Police Department uh, at a time when there was major reforms around police corruption, uh, police committing murders and all sorts of terrible things, and 10 of them getting killed the first year I was there, assassinated in the line of duty. I've been uh, obsessed with the challenges of doing more precise policing, more effective policing, more fair and just policing uh, for the rest of my life. and. Uh, I happened to meet somebody called Mark Rowley, who has the same obsessions. So just to remind us, of course, he's the relatively new commissioner at the Met. Professor, he took over the Met at very difficult, very trying times. Along with his top team, what is he trying to bring about? First of all, he's trying to ensure that there is more trust in the police in London. Secondly, that there's less crime uh, and less harm from crime. And thirdly, that we will do everything we can at the highest possible standards. So we want to raise the standards, have less crime, have more trust. You're a chief scientific officer. How do you help with the trust? How do you help with cutting crime? There's a science for all three of these things, which is really interesting. With respect to trust, uh, and we go back... uh, Uh, decades with the uh, U.S. Department of Justice looking at raising trust in uh, the poor neighborhoods of Newark, New Jersey, where uh, I actually grew up, uh, as well as Houston, Texas, other places that needed community policing. So it began uh, a long haul towards better uh, contact between neighbors in neighborhoods and their police, which was disrupted by the efficiency allocations of putting everything on 999 and dispatching police all over the place so they never got to know people in the neighborhood. And Sir Mark is trying to turn that around with the strongest ever neighborhoods policing program that will build on the dedicated ward officers for the 679 wards in London. Um, And we're trying to get even smaller with 15,000 hexagons so we can look at uh, how well resourced in relation to crime each hexagon may be. Uh, or may not be, so it can be be adjusted. And that brings us to the key to everything Mark's doing, which is precision, to have better measurement, uh, better uh, predictions about if we do this, then that will happen. And that's the kind of science that we're trying to bring to policing everywhere, and certainly the Met's out in front. This is backed up by data, is it, then? A- absolutely. Can you, obviously, I don't want to give anywhere sensitive, but can you give me an example of an area where this has already produced some results? Certainly. We have the uh, Violence Against Women and Girls Project, in which we're looking at 50,000 offences that qualify under the national definition. Uh, in the last 365 days, uh, we see, out of those 50,000 offences, 35,000 persons named by victims uh, and witnesses as suspects. And of those 35,000 persons, the top 100 are a thousand times more harmful than the bottom half of that whole group of 35,000. And to, to imagine that, in, in, you know, talking about the numbers in uh, the NHS budget, yeah. uh, this is even more spectacular because if you think of the shard as being 72 stories, uh, 72 times higher than a single-story building, we're looking at people who are a 1,000 stories higher than a single-story building. And what does that mean? That means that 90% of them have been accused of rape or murder as their most serious offense. So that, therefore, gives the officers a starting point of the sort of folk they should be speaking with. Is that right? Exactly right. And it helps the reorganization of what we call proactive policing, of which we have many hundreds in the Met, uh, to focus on the highest priorities. And so there is no such thing as a minor crime, but there's certainly uh, such a thing as uh, something more complicated than red, amber, and green. We're talking about super red at a level of height that we never imagined. And I, I didn't realize until we ran the numbers in the Met just how extreme that difference is between the most harmful and the average offenders in that category. 
So that was what is known as VAWG, Violence Against Women and Girls. Are you allowed? Are you able to tell me the next area you're looking at, or is that being worked on and it's covered by confidentiality? No, it's quite uh, open. We've done lots of neighborhood consultations around precision stop and search. So now instead of uh, stacking from the, the most serious to the, the safest, uh, with respect to uh, uh, people, we're looking at places. And so across the 679 wards in London, we find that the harm from weapons crimes, pr primarily knife robberies, but also stabbings and um, uh, assaults with knives, uh, that, uh, that problem, if we measure it in terms of sentencing guidelines, how many days in prison would you get for each of those offenses, we have half of the weapons crime in a little over 100 of the 679 wards. And so to concentrate stop and search, which uh, in the United States in relation to gun crime uh, has uh, consistently shown that stop and search is effective in preventing murder, in preventing grievous bodily harm, we can concentrate in not only in the top wards that have half of all the weapons problems, but in a small part of those wards. What, and the street level? At the street level, we are we're giving maps to the officers who are specially trained in doing precision stop and search. And they will be going to the places where people are most at risk of getting stabbed with training we're giving them in something called procedural justice theory. And that has 50 years of evidence behind it to show that if you're more respectful to people when you're going to have to do a stop and search, when you explain it, you give them reasons uh, having to do with protecting them and the neighborhood, that you build more trust in the police. So we bring together more trust and less crime with this higher standard of how to do a stop and search. Professor, we, was, was, prof, was it prof, sorry, professional judicial theory? Is that what you No, call it's it? called procedural Pro justice. Procedural, procedural justice. justice. So, so how long has that training been going on? Uh, well, we started the training uh, a few months ago, and we've trained now over 100 officers from uh, And in layman's unit. terms, it means I, I present my, I'm the officer, I present myself in, in a more agreeable fashion to you? Do I try and persuade you as to why I'm going to shut your pockets? Right? That's that's exactly what's been tested in the U.S. And if we find that if you do that in hot spots of crime, it raises public trust in police. Uh, it also helps to be associated with reduced crime. But there are these four pillars. The first is you need to listen to people. The second is that you have to treat them with neutrality. The third is with respect. And the fourth is why am I doing this? I'm doing this to help you. Okay. So correctly executed, I can say you are a fan of a tactic such as stop and search. Absolutely. But not incorrectly executed. No, God, absolutely. I hear you. And in the wrong places. Yeah. So many of my listeners, you as well, and I'm sure officers are reviewing some of the evidence we saw from the Notting Hill Carnival, where it would appear that young men almost at will are running up and down streets wielding machetes. Mm. The work that you bring with your scientific hat on, how would, the, how would you address something such as that? Well, Notting Hill is uh, a unique event, Indeed. and we Biggest have uh, many difficult issues to face there. Uh, it's, it's, it's an exception in terms of stop and search because we had Section 60s, which have a different evidentiary standard, um, and we had many officers uh, injured uh, and other issues uh, to, to be looking at in terms of the organization of that event. Our precision stop and search project, uh, led by uh, Deputy Assistant Commissioner Adelikin, uh, is focused on the daily safety in neighborhoods and in the most uh, knife-prone uh, uh, crime neighborhoods uh, around London. And that's where we hope to make the biggest difference in the long run with raising trust. That said, uh, uh, people who were at the carnival this weekend thought there was a very friendly um, atmosphere and they were, they were really, <laughs> considering how many millions of people <laughs> were there, yeah. uh, it was really uh, a triumph. You, you talk about raising trust. Professor, how important is it then in raising trust that a commissioner or a chief constable is able to dismiss officers who have broken some kind of broken the law broken the code broken their contract of employment because you're probably aware that there are restrictions now and we have an extraordinary position that the commissioner can't actually get rid of a rogue cop well i just heard a news summary uh on your show saying that it looks like the government's going to restore some of those powers 
to chief constable. You asked me what else I was working on. That, that was one of the issues. I was able to compare the rate at which constables were dismissed for gross misconduct by chief officers prior to the change in the rules in 2016. And then without any other change uh, for the next two years, I could compare that rate to the legally qualified chairs. So you can actually produce a table where we would have been prior to the introduction by uh, Home Secretary Theresa May. It's been published in the Cambridge Journal of Evidence-Based Policing, and it shows that for white officers, the number of uh, dismissals dropped in half under the legally qualified chairs compared to the chief officers in the same kinds of cases. Um, and with respect to the black officers, uh, at the same time, legally qualified chairs uh, started to raise the likelihood of dismissal relative to the, what the chief officers had done. This has to be a forward step. Well, I, I absolutely am convinced that we uh, hold chief officers to account. Most people think they have the power to fire, and the fact that they can't make those decisions under the regulations we've had since 2016, uh, at least without uh, having a criminal conviction in court, uh, it, it's really uh, putting the police in a no-win situation, and I hope the new uh, decision uh, is going to correct that. We've only got a minute or so left together, Professor. I'm going to ask you a mildly personal question. What attracted you to UK? Uh, a beautiful woman, uh, <laughs> uh, as well a British, as... Uh, I assume a British woman, right? Yeah, indeed. Well, we're very bo fortunate. Born in Somerset, and oh, uh, she's listening right now, so I hope <laughs> she's hearing it. No, the, uh, when did we get you? When did you come from I, the UK? I came right from the New York City Police Department uh, to study criminology because the Wolfson Professor of Criminology at Cambridge was teaching at Columbia Law School, and uh, I was helping him on a project, and uh, he helped me in really decide to not go to law school but to focus on criminology. And uh, I, I was brought into Scotland Yard to do ride-alongs uh, while I was a student in Cambridge. And I've been in love with England ever since. What are the differences, lastly, between policing in, the, say, New York and policing in London? I think the London policing is much more polite, much more legally focused and careful in everything it does. I, I think British people have no idea how good British policing is generally and how great the Met is compared to the police forces all around the world that look up to the Met. Well, listen, uh, New York's loss is our gain. And our thanks to a woman. Is she listening in Somerset? Is she the woman that managed to lure you no, across the... No, Pimlico. Oh, right. I, I'm sorry, I missed that. I thought you said Somerset. OK. Listening in London, managed to lure you across the uh, across the Atlantic. Thank you. Can we come up, perhaps catch up again within a year or so, see how the work's going? I'd be delighted. What's the next you. project we can judge you by, Professor? Uh, we're going to get the results of this focusing on the top 100 VOG offenders. And we're going to hopefully estimate how many murders and rapes we can prevent. Come see us again soon. Okay, we'll do. Good to have Thanks you. Thank you. Lawrence Sherman, Professor and Chief Scientific Officer at the Metropolitan Police in London.